That when Jesus came to earth, he came to die for all our sin. Porque todos, por naturaleza, sabemos que existe un Dios. Good morning. Welcome to Brentwood Lighthouse Baptist Church. We are delighted to have you tuning in today. Uh, we found out that the air quality was bad outside, so that meant we couldn't have a live service outside. We found out that the COVID was possibly uh, had negatively affecting us inside, so we can't have a service inside. So we're going to you directly over the internet, and uh, we're looking forward to a, a great time uh, uh, together. We hope that you'll join us as we praise, as we pray, and as we preach this morning. And uh, we pray that, uh, that um, this service and, the, and God's word reaches your hearts. And we welcome you to invite your friends, neighbors, if you want to call them now and tell them to tune in. This is the time to do that. But let's uh, just uh, begin with a word of prayer. Father, we praise you for the fact that you are in control of all things. Many things we don't understand in life, why things happen to us, why the storms of life come, why things that, uh, that seem to be setbacks are happening, and yet we know that you are in control, that you see the beginning and the end, and indeed you are the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega. And so we come to you with praise and with, uh, with trust that, that you have all things under control. We just pray that you would use us, help us to have our eyes open, to ways that you want to use us in the midst of um, this COVID crisis, in the midst of the uh, smoke in the air and the um, dangers of fires, in the midst of uh, protests going on and, and uh, um, things that are outside our control, we just give them over to you and I pray that we would walk in step with you and that your spirit uh, uh, would, would um, move in our county here, in, all, in, in Contra Costa County, that we might be able to see children and, uh, and uh, young people and parents and older people, all, of the, all people with their eyes directed to you, turning to you. I pray that you would use us, help us to see opportunities to share your love and to share the gospel with people around us. I pray that uh, we uh, would not just ride this out, but that we would walk in step with you. And I pray as we uh, go into the service today that we would uh, experience worship together and praise to you and we would be ready to hear your word and to be a part of what you're doing. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
this world dark in my day You are the light that shines and shows me the way Oh, the beauty of your majesty On the cross you showed your love for me Lighthouse Baptist Church. We thank you for participating, albeit virtually. Uh, we want to uh, have a good service, and you're part of that. And while we may not be able to see you or hear you, uh, we want you to participate anyway. I'm here to make uh, some announcements. Uh, we have, of course, this virtual service. We have service every Sunday, 11 o'clock. Uh, we also have a uh, Bible study on Sunday evening at 6 with virtual distances. And we have uh, a prayer service on Wednesday evening, similarly. Uh, right now we're working on the porch, so we're outside in conjunction with the instructions from the health services. Uh, we do want to uh, mention, uh, we have, have a ch as a church, as a congregationally run church we 
periodically mer work together uh, to build the church and to share with each other. Uh, we have set uh, September 6th, Sunday, September 6th in the afternoon for a meeting. Uh, there will be no voting there, but there will be a sharing of how we want to proceed. Uh, this COVID thing has uh, interfered with a lot, and we just recognize that, uh, like the pastor said, God's in charge, and we want to do what we can within the confines of what we are allowed. So, uh, 2 o'clock on September 6th, we're going to get together and we'll talk about what we're going to do, uh, how we're going to get there, and some ideas about what we might start anew. I want, also want to uh, tell you that we uh, want you to be our friends uh, here in the uh, the church, uh, whether you are attending uh, virtually or attending personally, when that's permitted, uh, we want you to join us. Even if you uh, just come once in a while, uh, we want to hear from you. Our mailing address is uh, P.O. Box 946, Brentwood 94513. So if you have anything you want to tell us, share with us, suggest prayers that you need or financial support, if that's your, uh, what you want to do, uh, please use that address. When we are open for uh, personal appearances, I uh, want to uh, tell you we're at tw uh, 2250 Jeffrey Way. Uh, we're just off of the... Uh, freeway at uh, the exit 33 and so uh, you're welcome to come again 11 o'clock on Sunday morning so um, that's all I have I want to uh, thank our wonderful musicians it's been a very nice thing and this is your chance I believe to do one more time thank you open in prayer. Father, I pray that uh, you would open our eyes, open our hearts, speak to us the words that you have for us today. In these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We're looking, if you want to open your Bibles, at uh, Matthew chapter 7. And they say that many a bad sermon has been rescued by a great conclusion. However, in this case, we're going to be talking about the Sermon on the Mount which is one of the greatest sermons of all time, if not the greatest sermon of all times. There are many books that are just written on that sermon alone, the sermon that Jesus uh, preached toward the beginning of his ministry, and it, uh, it, it cannot be topped. And so when you, now what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at the Sermon on the Mount for the next, uh, next number of weeks while, during, my during my time here. And, um, and, uh, but what we're going to do is begin with the conclusion. And we're going to begin with the conclusion because this sermon is so important 
that obviously at the end Jesus wants to make a powerful point about the importance of this sermon, but we would have the possibility of going all the way through, through this sermon without realizing the importance it has in our life. So I want to start out with the conclusion, what Jesus talked about, so that we can understand what it is and, and, and what we're dealing with here. And so Jesus um, in, uh, Ma uh, in Matthew 5 through 7 gives the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 7 to begin with, Jesus' conclusion. And it tells us in Matthew chapter 7, we're going to be looking at verses 24 through 29. It says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man. And we go to verse 29 as he finishes up, or verse 28. And so it was, when Jesus had ended these sayings, that people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them the, as one that has authority and not as scribes. Here it is, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and all of a sudden everybody realizes that it's over, that it's done, that they've, that they've just heard perhaps the most amazing message in their lifetime, and they're sitting there with their jaws open, and they're saying, what is this? I've never seen this kind of authority in, in the way someone speaks. And they, and they were probably, they may have been thinking if they were living in our days, I hope somebody recorded that. I hope somebody wrote that down because I, I, I want to remember what he said. But this is the end of it. This is the conclusion to the story. And it says that they were astonished at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So the thing that stood out was when Jesus spoke, everybody realized that he had the authority to speak, that what he said they needed to listen to because it was coming from someone that had authority. Now, uh, I remember when my three, uh, my three kids were all uh, uh, under, uh, under five years old, had three kids under five years old, and I remember many times I would be driving along and they would be making a lot of noise in the back. I would have them in, in three car seats in the back and they'd be making a lot of noise. And, and, and it's not easy to control that when you're driving. So what I decided to do was just to turn on the radio and if they got louder each time, just turn it up a little louder and continue to proceed on wherever I was going. And pretty soon, no big deal. They're just making a lot of noise. They're screaming and whatever in the background, but I can just keep on going. However, there were times when I was driving along, not very many, but there were times I was driving along and I heard this noise that was something like, whoa, whoa. And I realized that wasn't them screaming, it was, it was the car behind me. I would look, I would see lights on the car and then I would hear a, something like this. Pull over. Now when I heard that, that was a voice of authority. I, I couldn't turn, I didn't turn up the radio, I turned it down, I pulled over and I was very attentive to what the officer had to say to me because he spoke with authority. It tells us here that Jesus spoke with authority and so what he said is very important for us to take in. We need to take it in. So it says, um, it says there in verse 24, therefore whoever hears these words of mine and does them, I liken to a wise man. The first thing I want us to notice is that when God speaks, it requires a response. When God speaks, it requires a, a response. So Jesus, God in the flesh, was there speaking. It required a response. And a lot of times we, we think that, that, that we've done our duty if we come and we listen to a sermon. Um, We've done, we, or, or when we go to a Bible study, if we listen at the Bible study and we learn something and we come back the next week and we learn something, that's, that's doing our duty. But it says here that Jesus said uh, that the wise person is the person that not only hears but does. You, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the book of James, chapter 1, where it says in verse 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man... Be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. In verse 22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh in the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. And so James is telling us the same thing that Jesus is telling us. 
it's not enough to hear the word. It's not enough to come to a Bible study, and, and yet this happens in so many places. I'm guilty of it. You're guilty of it. We come and we think, okay, I went to a Bible study. Now I've done my deed for the week. And next week I'll pick up where, where I left off. But what we need to be saying is, okay, here's what God said. What's my response? What am I going to do about it? James says that. Don't be just hearers, but doers of the word. Every time you hear God's word, the question is, what am I going to do about it? Now, I was just thinking, I've had the privilege of being here at this church for the last five years, over five years now. And during that time, I've preached many sermons. Uh, and, and I'm just wondering that uh, if, if each of us, including myself, after we received the sermon, if we said on the way out, that, was, that wasn't a bad sermon, it was okay, but what am I going to do about it? Just imagine if every week after we heard a sermon, we said, God, what do you want me to do about it? And then actually we did something. We did what we said we were going to do. And the next week maybe we came back and we, we shared that. And so every, would your life, would you be any different if every week you said, you know what? I hear God and I'm going to do something about it. Well, that, that's important for us. Whether we're doing a Bible study, uh, on Wednesday night, Sunday night, during the week in someone's home, or whether we're hearing a message, or whether we're just hearing directly from, from Jesus. Even more so, he says it's important, you're not, it's the difference between, difference between being wise and being foolish. So he says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, does them I'm likening him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. This is the only time that Jesus talks about carpentry. Did you know he was a carpenter? It tells us in, in the book of Mark that, that people were trying to ridicule him, him and they said, uh, who is he? He's just a carpenter. Uh, but Jesus, when he talks about carpentry, he knows what he's doing. He, the, probably the first, uh, you know, until he was 30 years old, he was working as a carpenter. And so now he's giving us an illustration that we need to take to heart. And he uses, uh, he uses carpentry uh, to give this illustration. So he says the wise man, wise man builds his house on a rock and the ra uh, rains descend and the floods come and the winds blew and beat the house and it did not fall for it was founded on a rock so first thing we need Jesus says is is your life is like a house you build your life a little bit at a time and when it comes to the end you want to look back and say I, I lived wisely and in order to do that, it matters what you build your house on. And Jesus says you need to build your house on a rock. And he says if you do that, when the storms come. Now notice he doesn't say if the storms come. He says when the storms come. So you know what? In life, there are going to be storms. We can count on it because he says when the storms come. We all have been experiencing storms over this last summer. But there are other storms in our lives when we, we are met with challenges that we weren't expecting, that we never would have, have planned on. And one of those storms that we have to deal with is death. Death of people around us. Um, we were, uh, a couple weeks ago, we were visiting, we were headed to, uh, to Nebraska to visit my mom, who's 90 five years old and in the last season of her life and as we just about got there we were we were a day or so away driving um, my wife got news that her sister-in-law died her sister-in-law we didn't expect her sister-in-law to die but her sister-in-law died that's why she's not here today she's at she's at the the funeral and her sister-in-law had 10 kids and and, uh, and no one was expecting it and yet there she died and everybody had to deal with it. There are things that happen in our life that we don't expect, and those are the, those are the storms that come in our life. Sometimes, they, they're, they're just the circumstances of life. Sometimes, it's Satan who's trying to trip us up. Sometimes, it's God. Did you know that? The Bible tells us in, in the book of Jonah, chapter 1, that Jonah tried to run from God, and God prepared a storm. God prepared a storm for Jonah. 
He needed to get Jonah's attention, and a storm was the way that he did that. Sometimes God says, I'm going to get your attention with the storm. And so we don't need to be, we don't need to be uh, afraid of storms. We need to recognize that it matters what we build our foundation on. What is that rock? And I'd like to uh, look at a, a few verses that talk about uh, the rock. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay, that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build on this foundation, and so it says the foundation that we lay our lives on as Christians is Jesus Christ. People have all kinds of things that they lay their foundation on. Some uh, lay it on their, plan, on their education. Okay, if I get a good education, that's going to carry me through life. Some uh, on possessions. Some on relationships. Some on achievements. All of those things we can lay a foundation on. But Jesus says the only one, the only one that counts is the one that's a rock. And he's speaking as a carpenter. When you build a house, you could, you could start building a house. But if you don't dig down to that rock, you don't have a, a solid foundation. Well, let's just go, actually, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. It says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe in him, he is precious, but unto them which are disobedient, the stone shall be uh, which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which, which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they also were appointed. And so Peter is saying, this rock is Jesus. You need to, you need to put your trust in him. And so when we go through life, Many people are confronted with the gospel. And the gospel is this. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot make ourselves right with God. There's nothing we can do to make ourselves right with God. It's only Jesus by putting our trust in Jesus. We, and many times people need to dig down in their life until they find the answer, which is Jesus. Jesus is the foundation to place your trust in him, to have your sins forgiven, to have a new life. That's, that is our foundation. And and the truth is, many times, uh, that's offensive to people. People say, uh, many people you run into say, I, I, don't, I don't want to have to put my trust in Jesus. I'll do it all myself. And, it's, and Peter says, if you do that, he's going to be a stumbling block to you. Because you don't want to hear that. And, and, and so you'll, you'll fall over Jesus. And a lot of times when people, when people hear Jesus mentioned, they don't want to hear that. Because that means that, that, that reminds them of their sin, of their inadequacy. And, he, and other people that try to ignore him, it says that, that he, will, he will roll over them. Either way, it is judgment for when you don't make Jesus your rock. My brother-in-law, uh, a while back, was trying to, to uh, make sure his, ho his house was solid, didn't have any leaks. And so he, he, um, he wanted me to dig down uh, six feet around the, a trench around his house. And so... I was digging a trench around his house, and, and uh, it was a lot of work. But we finally got down to the bottom. One bad thing happened during that event. He was, he was, trying, to, he was trying to use a big uh, bar to go lower, and so he, so he told me to get down there and hold the bar. Right? And so he had a sledgehammer, and he was hammering on the bar. And as he was hammering on the bar with all his might, it, the, the hammer bounced off uh, the bar and onto my back. And so, I don't know if you've ever, ever had anybody slam a sledgehammer into your back, but it makes a rather memorable experience. And I remember it to this day, not with pleasant memories. But Jesus is trying to say, I want you to remember this. This is very important. I am the rock that you need to build the foundation of your life on. If you're not a believer, you need to put your faith in me. If you are a believer, you need to live like you're trusting Jesus every day. Because storms will come. And scripture tells us that, that when the storms come, we need to trust in him because he will see us through it. He will see us through the storms. I, I like uh, Psalm chapter 91, Psalm 91. 
because it talks about that very thing. Psalm 91, verses 5 through 8 says this. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor the, nor the arrow that flieth in the day, nor the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh to you. Only with, with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even most high, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh unto thy dwelling. And so the storms of life are the times when we, when we realize God is doing something, we cling to him the most. So Jesus talks about finding a good foundation, and he compares a good foundation to a rock and a foolish foundation. He goes on to say, but, um, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain will ascend, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And so he's saying, if you don't continue, for us that are believers, Jesus is our foundation for eternity, right? But we need to, can trust, we need to continue to trust him for life. And so the first thing is what you build on. Because as we've seen, uh, floods come, fires come, viruses come. And we always need to come back to trusting in Jesus. So the first thing is, what's your foundation on? But the second thing is you need to build a house. And the house is your life. You build your life with things also that last. And that, in the passage we refer to in, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says that you have, as Christians, you, you, if you're trusting in Christ, you, you have a guarantee that you're going to heaven but what's it going to be like when you get there? Have you, brought, have, you, have you invested your life? Have you built your house on things that last? And he talks about the things that don't last are things that burn up. Now this morning, I, uh, uh, my wife was worried about me. She's in, in Ohio. She calls, she has my daughter call me because maybe she thinks my, I'll listen to my daughter the more, than, more than her. I'm not sure. But she said that she heard that there's a fire, uh, a, uh, a warning in, Costa, in our county and that maybe we were going to have to shut down church and so be ready to have the things that I value and have my foster daughter, Alicia, gather them together so that we can run home, take those things, and get out of here. Uh, now, I think she was a little uh, mis, uh, misinformed about the danger of the fire here. There is some danger, I think, down in uh, some other places. But nevertheless, she was saying, Get the things that are important, right? And get ready to get, get out of here in case that fire comes. Well, when we think about our lives, we need to think about what things are going to last for eternity. What things are just things that, I, that I'm going to enjoy now, but they, they could be here today, gone tomorrow. And the things that I think about that are going to last, number one, is God. God's going to be there forever. So we are never wasting our time. If we're worshiping God, we're never wasting our time if we're worshiping our God, worshiping God, because guess what we'll be doing forever? Worshiping God. We're never wasting our time if we're praying, because we'll be talking to God forever. He will be there. We'll be in his presence. We're never wasting our time if we're investing our time in reaching people for Christ. Because for every baby born, there was a time when they were not. But there never will be a time when they will not be. So invest it. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes it's not easy. But, when, but unless people have Jesus as the rock of their salvation, they're going to spend eternity without him. So we're, we're never wasting our time. We're investing in building our house. And we're investing in sharing God with people. We're never wasting our time if we're listening, reading, and applying God's word to our life. If we're listening and reading. You know, I heard a story, uh, a true story, about a prince that was uh, imprisoned in Spain for life. He spent 33 years in prison. And, and this particular prison that he was in was a prison that you die in. You, once you go there, you, you stay there. So he spent the rest of his life there. 
And when, they, when he finally died, they opened up the, they came in there, because they just send the food to him under, underneath the door or whatever, and they saw on the walls, he, had, he only had one thing, he had the Bible with him. He only had one book, the Bible, the whole 33 years. And they looked and they found on the walls all kinds of writing he had scratched with nails. And they had, writing had things like this. The Bible has exactly such and such number of words. The exact middle of the Bible is such and such. This particular verse contains every letter in the alphabet except for two. All kinds of Bible trivia. This guy had 33 years with the Bible and he found out Bible trivia. That's what he spent his life doing. If we hear God's word but we don't do it, it's just Bible trivia. It's only when we say, what am I going to do about this? That God, God makes changes in our lives through the Holy Spirit. So he said, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rains descend and the floods came and the winds blew and beat the house and it fell down with a great fall. Here's what I want to encourage you to do, first of all. Find some things that, say, that you say are, that God says are worth investing your life in. That is your house. That's, that, that, that's what you're building your house on. Because, you know, all of us, in, in reality, most of us uh, adults, the thing that we invest our, our money in is our house, right? Most of, your, most of your investment will come in your house. But Jesus is saying, Make your life your house that you're going to invest, uh, invest for eternity so that you can send ahead the, your, your investments. He, he said, don't, uh, he said um, that people don't invest your life in things like gold and silver that thieves can break in and steal. But instead, send, a, send ahead spiritual treasures that will last forever. And so what I'm going to encourage you this week, now that we've heard the conclusion, it's, 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 it's quite the conclusion, because in the conclusion he, conclusion, he says, look, all of these things that I just said, don't just hear them. It'll be a waste of time. Don't just be impressed with them. Don't just be amazed at my authority, but apply them. And so here's my, here's my, uh, here's my challenge for the weeks to come. Each week when we hear a part of this message of the Sermon on the Mount, Ask yourself, what is it that I'm going to do about what Jesus said? How am I going to apply this to my life? And how am I going to share Jesus, the foundation, that every life needs to be, uh, every house our lives need to be based on? How am I going to share that with others? Let's close in prayer as the uh, worship team comes up. Father, I just thank you uh, for this message that Jesus gave us. And I thank you for the fact that he, may, he wants uh, to wake us up. I pray that we would have our eyes wide open to the fact that, uh, that you want, to, uh, want us to invest our lives wisely. That you want us to have our foundation on you. I pray that if there's anyone listening today that has been grappling with, uh, with you, that they would realize they need, that they are sinners, that they cannot save themselves, that they need to put their trust in Jesus who died for them to take away their sins, to give them eternal life. I pray that uh, for those that are listening that need to put their faith in Christ, I pray that they would admit their sinners, that they uh, would um, believe that Jesus died for them, and they would commit to following him today. I pray for the rest of us that as we, as we think about the lives that we're building, that we would build for eternity. And these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Joy.
on to him who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Amen. Thank you. And to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, nuestro Salvador. Glory, majesty, dominion, and power. <laughs>